History itself is a lot more complicated than what we are taught in grade school. Before modern technology and all of our resources nowadays, the only way to learn more about the world was to explore and go on grand expeditions. There was so much on Earth that had yet to be discovered. Expeditions a few centuries ago were difficult, dangerous, and mysterious. With a countless number of pirates, shipwrecks, unexpected events, and mysteries, no one can really know for sure what exactly happened when the people of the past decided to learn more about Mother Earth. The Hall of Records Our next story is a little less tangible than a lost ship, now that you'd know it by the name. Libraries are rich sanctuaries of knowledge and entertainment. Whether you enjoy turning the pages of a juicy murder mystery, or you're someone who prefers the practical nature of a dictionary, it can be relaxing to lose yourself in the quiet that exists between the walls of books. But that's just not something that's going to happen in the Hall of Records. Said to contain the entirety of human knowledge from 10,000 BC up to at least ancient Egypt, no one knows where this mysterious library is or if it's even real. Much like the lost city of Atlantis, there's enough documentation of the library and other texts that have been found that it could actually exist. But other than a few scrolls and personal journals, there's not much physical evidence of the Hall of Records. And when humanity finds an inconsistency, we like to speculate. Conspiracy theories range from a hidden library underneath the Sphinx of Giza to an ancient alien archive. Because it's not a true conspiracy party without aliens, right? The thing is that the Egyptian government has forbidden any type of archaeological work to even come close to the Sphinx. We know there's a compartment under there, but not how big it is or what might be inside it. It could be the Hall of Records. It could be Elvis's grave. Who knows? We certainly don't because not only is no one allowed to go in, but the use of sonar is also banned. But even if there is a secret library under the Sphinx, there's no way it could hold all that knowledge. Libraries are huge, and with good reason. Paperbacks take up a ton of space. Unless we humans didn't learn a whole lot in the thousands upon thousands of years the library is supposed to hold, including more modern knowledge if you listen to the rumors, there's no physical way all the information would even fit under the Sphinx. It wouldn't fit in twice the space. There's a lot about ancient Egypt we just don't know. Between time and tomb raiders, a big chunk of that history has been lost. Still, some of what we have found suggests that in ancient times, Egypt was a thriving, technologically advanced society with heavy extraterrestrial influence. So, could the archive be under the Sphinx? Or is it just some myth people got hooked on? Tell us what you think in the comments below. Expedition reveals the mysteries at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. But first, this story takes us back to the ocean. But this time, the cold doesn't come from ice, it comes from death. Only a mere 5% of the ocean floor has ever been explored, at least by humans anyway. By comparison, people like John Franklin and those after him have mapped around 22% of the water surface. Even the Gulf of Mexico, one of the most devotedly mapped regions of the ocean, still holds secrets to be discovered. And that's exactly why the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, otherwise known as NOAA, went on a 23-day expedition to explore the Gulf's vastly unknown depths. And what they found was positively remarkable. So often we think we know what life should be, but this unique opportunity has given us a brief, personal look into the alien world of the deep sea. A hundred years ago, no one would have imagined there could be life without light. We humans and many of the animals we share the planet with depend on sight as an important way of navigating our environment. The plants we eat use the light from the sun to grow. And yet, along the 21,000 miles of seafloor the mission explored, there wasn't a single ray of sunlight. What scientists did find was a healthy, thriving population of plants and animals they never imagined could exist. Moments like these are common to science. In the case of the Gulf's many new species, they often made their own light. Many of them existed without eyes, making sight a non-issue. The plants flourished via a process known as chemical synthesis rather than photosynthesis. But this impressive exploration effort wasn't just for the heck of it. The data these scientists brought back could change the way conservation is handled across the entire Gulf. 
Trawling is a major problem for the delicate deep sea communities, but their research is the first step in tightening protections in the region. The John Franklin Expedition This story takes us on the journey of one of the long-standing tragic mysteries of the Arctic. One of the last indomitable frontiers, this treacherous blend of land and sea has claimed many lives. One moment your boat is cutting through the ice, and the next thing you know, you're trapped in the cold that regularly reaches minus 40 Fahrenheit. Even the locals know full well not to test the spirits of the North. But there will always be those who try to prove themselves against the fury of Mother Nature. John Franklin was a decorated officer in the British Royal Navy, a husband, a governor, and an avid adventurer. Despite humble beginnings, he carved a reputation for himself as a man who would do whatever it took to get the job done. He already had several sea expeditions under his belt, including three into the Arctic, and he didn't care about silly things like hunger or spirits. What concerned him was his reputation. After being stabbed in the back by his fellow bureaucrats, Franklin was facing a shameful recall back to England. His wife begged him and those in power for one last voyage into the Arctic. After all, if people forget why they called you a hero, you can skulk home with your tail between your legs or you can remind them. Franklin was granted two ships, the Erebus and the Terror. His mission was to map out the Northwest Passage. Mindful of past experiences, he had the vessels packed with enough dried fruit and canned meat to last the two crews three years and set sail in 1845. With eyes on them around the world, the group sailed all the way to the Lancaster Sound and disappeared. The nature of sea travel being what it was back then, it took a little while for anyone to realize the group was missing. So by the time search parties were sent out, the two boats had been stranded for weeks. Franklin's wife lobbied hard for more ships to be sent out looking. Her stubborn optimism swept up the nation overshadowing any personal doubts she had for the crew's survival. She even bragged that with all the food they packed, no one need to worry until at least 1848. Little did she know that the food was poisoned. You see, the meat had been packed in metal cans that were sealed with lids made of lead. Because of this, John Franklin died shortly after the two vessels were trapped. His crew, faced with an entire winter of freezing cold in an unpredictable environment, decided to make a break for it. The Inuit people have known what happened next for over a hundred years. Stories of encounters with violent restless spirits began shortly after the two boats disappeared. But it wasn't until 2014 when the Canadian government disguised a geopolitical move against Russia as an archaeological expedition that the true horrors of John Franklin's journey were discovered. Bodies found showed evidence of scurvy and hypothermia. But with all those sailors and two ships found 150 years after they disappeared, one soul has still yet to be located. With his pride shattered, his mission unsuccessful, and his crew reduced to savages, John Franklin's spirit won't be able to rest until he, too, is finally brought back home. The Worst Journey in the World if studying the ecosystem of the forest floor and making maps of the frozen Arctic seas isn't exciting enough, we present to you the worst journey in the world. Famously written about in Apsley Cherry Garrard's memoir, this sprint for science and glory took an unsurprisingly terrible turn. Once again, a political push into the frozen tundra. This journey to the Antarctic, where temperatures regularly hit minus 40 Celsius, was both a race to the South Pole and a push to further society's understanding of the link between birds and dinosaurs. Taking into consideration the reverse seasons of Antarctica, where the English summer was winter and vice versa, the men made their preparations and set sail relatively early in order to build their base camp and secure access to food. Determined to do things right, the crew fought snow and ice, chiseling their way towards the last known location of a colony of emperor penguins. You might find yourself wondering just what, if any importance, such a slow, dumb-looking bird could have possibly held to modern science. But back in 1910, zoologists looked at their stiff, upright bodies and flightless wings and came to the conclusion that penguins, emperor penguins in particular, were the most closely related avians to dinosaurs. 
At the time, they called them the missing link between reptiles and birds. Of course, now we know that their clumsiness on land is the sacrifice that penguins made in order to perfect their mastery of the water. Their evolution isn't primitive, but rather a finely tuned adaptation to one of the most extreme environments on the planet. Actually, the closest living relative to the T-Rex is your everyday backyard chicken. But they thought if they could just snatch an egg at the perfect moment in its development, they'd be able to prove their theory and unlock the secrets of evolution itself. They were expecting a little dinosaur inside a frozen egg, but all they got was misery. Between blizzards and cold so strong even matches refused to light, it's a wonder that Cherry Garrard was able to make it back to England at all. But the eggs he carried held no genetic secrets, only lifeless chicks. And despite several attempts at rescue, the men still left behind never made it out of the ice alive. Garrard maintained that not only was his escape far from cowardice, but that the sacrifice of his friends was nothing short of heroism. They spent their entire winter in the Antarctic, occupying their time with reading and observing weather telemetry. We hope you enjoyed this video. Let us know which one of these stories really impressed you the most. Do you know about another cool life-changing story? If you liked the video, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you'll be the first to know when we post a new video. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.